Okay, this slide has uh, my Twitter handle. How many of you are on Twitter right now? Okay, so you can tweet around and, and share with it. And then that's my email address. I actually mean to put that there. If somebody has any questions or comments or want to continue the dialogue with me uh, after the presentation or after today, feel free to uh, email me. I promise to, um, to respond. Um, I always say that that's the most important slide of any of my presentations. I'm an endocrinologist, and I think there's only one or two of us in the world that can put a slide like that. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> All right, maybe I should just stay on that slide. <laughs> so um, I want to start because this is evidence-based medicine, and it, 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 it's important to me that we start with a patient as a result of this. And this is Maria Luisa, and I want you to uh, look at Maria Luisa. I know some of you are not clinicians, but you can still look at another human being and try to understand what that human being is going through. So look at her. And then think of a word that describes what you think is Maria Luisa's state of mind. What would that word be? You can yell it out. Depressed. Yeah. Overwhelmed. Yeah, so I heard a bunch of them, including overwhelmed. And uh, you're right, you've made a correct diagnosis. Uh, Maria Luisa lives with multiple chronic conditions. Um, she's on dialysis three times a week, eats mostly cardboard, um, lives with her son and, 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 and his family, uh, she's from Peru, that's where I'm from as well, but she lives in Alaska uh, with her son. Son works there with the two daughters, and uh, she doesn't speak English. So her main contact is this family that lives with her and on the phone with people in, in, back in Peru. When Maria Luisa uh, comes to see uh, healthcare, any healthcare professional, the question that she has is, what's best for me? What's best for my family? And what we hope when we interact with patients like Maria Luisa, is that the answer that we are going to be able to offer her is that our care is that answer, is that we want, that what we are able to offer her is the best for her and her family. That's the goal. Now, when we think about evidence-based medicine, we often think about uh, the evidence itself. And for many people that are partially initiated on evidence-based medicine, to say it elegantly, it means if there's a randomized trial about something, I must apply it and prescribe it to Maria Luisa. And so, as you can see, Maria Luisa has a number of pill, bo uh, pill boxes there that she's contemplating in an overwhelmed and depressed fashion, as some of you described. And yeah, there's a randomized trial for that pill, but there's also randomized trials supporting that one, and that one, and that one, and that one, and that one. And of course, she's also drinking something there and eating something, and we know those are probably observational studies supporting those. <laughs> So the application of evidence in a raw way to a person like Maria Luisa doesn't seem to care for Maria Luisa. It addresses maybe some of her problems, but you never, you, none of you describe Maria Luisa as alleviated, cared for, satisfied, in a state of well-being. Now, when I started, as, as Ben was saying, when I started uh, this, about this time 20 years ago, my journey into evidence-based medicine, what caught my attention was the evidence-based bit, right? Understanding what made evidence compelling, what, what corrupted the evidence, what made it uh, helpful and, and, and useful. Um, and in that journey, I, which is now, again, 20 years old, I've learned that what we really want from evidence is for it to be trustworthy and to be useful. And we heard about these things uh, this morning. And these are the kinds of things that make evidence trustworthy. You know, that it's independently produced, which of course is an agenda in and of itself, isn't it? Most of the evidence that matters is no longer independently produced. Independently, in this case, refers to being produced by and funded by parties that don't care about the direction of the answer, that don't have a profit or a stake in the direction of the answer beyond caring for patients. We don't have that for the most part. It's very, very limited. Uh, it has to be error-proof, it has to be spin-free, and it has to be fully reported. And we know there's an important agenda uh, in, in place for fully reporting the results of studies. So that might uh, create a body of evidence that is trustworthy, and we're far away from that situation. Um, we also want evidence that is useful, that supports the translation of that evidence into practice, that is directly applicable to patients like Maria Luisa, and that it accounts for the practical considerations that patients have to take into account when applying that evidence into their lives. 
How big are the tallies? How often do I have to take them? How am I going to pay for them? How do they go with the rest of the stuff that I have to do for my health? And we heard this morning from, uh, from John Ioannidis that we're also far from getting to the useful bit uh, of, of, of evidence. And in order to produce evidence that's trustworthy and useful, there is no other way than through collaboration. We need to have large consortia of, of different parties working together in a collaborative fashion in context where the evidence will be applied and using multiple methods, quantitative, qualitative, both together to fully understand, fully create a body of evidence that can help people like Maria Luisa. So debates about this kind of evidence or that kind of evidence, qualitative versus quantitative, oh, this is all ridiculous. We need all of it uh, because none of those methods by itself can fully inform the process of translating an insight into care. So we need trustworthy and we need useful evidence. And so this to the right is how we respond to patients like Maria Luisa. We have innovations, we have alternatives, we produce guidelines that tell people what to do, we produce quality or performance measures like that A1C less than 7% that, decide, that, that guide our practice and tell us how we might achieve uh, goals. This has an important shortcoming. These tools that people think are tools of evidence-based medicine have an important shortcoming. And that important shortcoming is that these tools help us care for people like Maria Luisa. But the challenge in medicine is to take care of Maria Luisa. And there's a significant distance that the clinician and the patient will have to move to go from one place to the other. So how might we get there? It's interesting, if you ask a bunch of medical students, what do people like Maria Luisa need? The first answer is education. We need to educate the patient. Let's produce more, more education materials and, and educate them and go to their homes and educate them and give them more information because information will set you free and, and it will be great and give more information. And so that's wonderful. And yes, people need information, but Maria Luisa will not come to, to our offices and our clinics uh, with their health problems and will be satisfied with information. Information is not enough. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Others say, no, what Maria Luisa needs is choice. We need to give her, Maria Luisa, options, ways, alternative ways forward so that Maria Luisa can select and choose her way and exercise her autonomy. Yet again, Maria Luisa does not come to her offices requesting choice. Neither information nor choice. What Maria Luisa needs is care. So in the last 10 years, after the effort on evidence-based, the effort goes back to medicine. How do we make evidence care? Because that is, that is the job. That's the task. We can do everything we want with all the studies and everything, all the summaries and all the tools to put it. But it, if the evidence does not lead to care, it's all for nothing. So what, what Maria Luisa needs is for clinicians and patients to be able to think through, talk through, feel through the situations that they're in in order to fully capture in high definition what the situation is and identify the ways to provide and, and deliver care. Uh, we've been developing this idea of a diagnostic conversation in which the first task is determining what is the situation or what aspect of Maria Luisa's situation is the one that demands action at this point, why we need to do anything about it, how do we care, and then what are the uh, actions that the situation, that best address the situation that the situation demands. And you can see the arrow goes back and forth because in the dialogue with the patient, in the conversation, we will uncover aspects of the situation that only become clear as we see what the potential alternatives are. So think about a patient, this will be a ridiculous example, but just to, just to illustrate, think about a patient with a very large pelvic tumor, and the situation is, is set, uh, set, uh, set forward such that this large uh, uh, pelvic tumor will kill the patient. And we tell the patients as much. And so we're looking to prevent the patient from dying, and we move to the right side and say, what are the actions that address the situation, that, that, that respond to the situation? Well, we can give you chemotherapy, but maybe five in 100 people will survive the chemotherapy. 95 will die. 
Or we can do a hemicorporectomy where we cut your body in half, we throw away the bottom half with the tumor, and you will survive from here up. You laugh, but it's a real operation. Um, and, uh, and the patient might hear those two options, uh, may want to go back and challenge maybe uh, the situation was framed perhaps not in the right way. I have a pelvic tumor. This pelvic tumor will kill me. What are the ways of dying that I have now moving forward? And now the set of options change dramatically to something completely different. So this is a dynamic process in which it's not just about what are my options and let's choose, but it's clearly understanding the situation, understanding how certain actions address the situation, and then uh, work through, think through, talk through, feel through, until we, until the clear answer arises. So in that context, the idea of shared decision making then becomes essentially an exercise in which once you've established what the situation is, you take these options as hypotheses, these evidence-based options as hypotheses that are tested in the conversation with the patient. And then eventually, the best solution emerges, becomes clear. So this is very different from the mechanical approach of just give them information, just give them choice. In this situation, the patient and the clinician are working through together. They're caring. We've, um, many of you have seen this before. We've developed these tools now a number of years ago. This is for choosing your next diabetes medication. And so in this case, patients might look at issues that matter in deciding their next diabetes medication. And for instance, patients with type 2 diabetes may be worried about their weight and how these drugs may affect their weight. As they look at the different drugs available and how they'll affect their weight, they might be attracted to the two options that help them lose weight, uh, liraglutide and SGL2 inhibitors. And then the clinician can easily ask, well, what aspect of those options matter to you now? Well, I would be interested in knowing how you take them. Well, one of them is an injectable drug, and the other one is a pill. Oh, I like the pill. Okay, what else matters to you? In the United States, very important for us what the out-of-pocket cost might be. And that one is $8 a day compared to metformin, which the patient was taking at 10 cents a day, this is a big difference. Some people are gonna be cost sensitive and may reject this. Others might, uh, let's, see what it, let's see if we can afford it and go on with it. If they're cost sensitive, they may go back and look at that injectable one, that's $11 a day, not so good. Look at the gliptins, which is weight neutral, one pill a day, $7 a day, not so cool. Look, maybe I can't afford weight loss or weight neutral. How about the little weight gain? So funny your ears, one pill a day, 10 cents a day, that's my medicine. That discussion, it is not about selecting the diabetes drug. It's about the clinician carefully understanding what are the reasons patients have for finding one of these alternatives helpful or not helpful. It's to finding the reasonable alternative by listening to the reasons people have for doing things. This is how we get to know our patients. This is how we get to enjoy the clinical interactions. This is how we get to care. And you can see this on the videos. I mean, this is a, a still from a video of a clinician discussing cholesterol lowering with one of our patients. The clinician is looking at the computer screen and looking at the cholesterol numbers to see how they fare in relation to the guidelines. The patient is looking uh, to the left of the clinician's uh, shoulder. This is the 18th floor of the Mayo Clinic building in Rochester, Minnesota. There's an uh, aluminum shelf between the 17th and 18th floor, and peregrine falcons sit on the aluminum shelf while they're eating small rodents. And so there's blood and, and guts and being spilled. So, so while well, the clinician is looking at the cholesterol profile, the patient is watching the Discovery Channel, you know, for, 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 for the But compare that to the situation when they're using a shared decision making uh, situation. I, 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 the, 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 the frame is smaller, they're working together, the computer is to the side, they're interacting. These are two humans now. And then this, we found again and again and again in our videos of uh, clinicians engaging in shared decision making, in truth shared decision making, not in the mechanical, or oh, what are your options, here are your choices, you decide, but the, the real caring approach that this is not uncommon, that people actually laugh with each other. In routine encounters, sometimes even about diabetes, which is one of the most boring visits that you can imagine in <laughs> clinical practice. And then there's this, Go back, going back to Maria Luisa. You may determine what is the best course of action for Maria Luisa, and that may add on to what Maria Luisa is already doing. But if at some point Maria Luisa doesn't do what she's supposed to be doing, we will be very quick at labeling her as non-compliant. And non-compliance is a very challenging label because it, it suggests a problem of character. That there's something fundamentally wrong with Maria Luisa. Think about it. Would you invite to a birthday party a non-compliant person? 
they might show up without a gift. Think about it. <laughs> Not a good idea. So, but, so rather than, than thinking of this, when we think about the uh, patient that is non-compliant, we may want to think about, and this again, how does evidence help us with this? We might think about that, th that we've overwhelmed them. And many of you said, she looks overwhelmed. And what we've overwhelmed them is their ability to do the work that they have to do to be a patient. This notion of the work of being a patient is an enormous black hole in medical education and medical practice. There is no chapter in any medical textbook about the work of being a patient. We've ignored this issue at all. It has not been important. We have not considered it. And yet, it is a real issue. Patients have to make sense of the work. They have to plan the work and enroll others in it. They have to do the work. And they have to find that the work is worth doing again tomorrow. And this is a critical issue for patients with chronic conditions. And to do this work, patients have to have enroll their capacity to do that work. And that capacity comes from these areas, from their sense of a purpose in life. We're beginning to ask our chronic patients, uh, what are the sources of joy in your life? And it's amazing how frequently we draw a blank. Just a blank stare, a person going back and thinking, and that cannot come up with a single source of joy in their life. If you don't have that fuel in the tank, what makes you do this work tomorrow? Uh, issues of resilience and literacy and bandwidth. Social is very interesting because it's two components. One is the ability to, the ability to ask for help and the uh, issue of having a social network that you can tap to ask for help, things that my mother-in-law have lost, actually. Anyway, but the, the, uh, it, that these are the kinds of things that actually allow you to have capacity beyond the one that you have for yourself. So we need to understand that in implementing evidence into the lives of people with multiple chronic conditions, we must consider that this evidence will represent work for the patient and their family and that that work will require capacity to be mobilized to the work. Capacity, by the way, that is the same capacity that fuels the work of being alive, of pursuing your life, hopes, and dreams, your job, taking care of your family. So we compete with clinical work with, with that. Going back to Maria Luisa, if we get the evidence-based medicine right, we should be able to move Maria Luisa from a position of noncompliance, of overwhelm, to a position in which we solve the imbalance of workload and capacity, a much better diagnosis than noncompliance, which we can do by reducing the workload, which might require prioritization and deep prescribing, or by improving capacity, which might come from self-management training or palliative care to control <coughs> symptoms, and by mobilizing uh, resources in the community or financial resources. Like Maria Luisa, when she got this elevator, she didn't have to be stuck on the second floor when her family left the house waiting for them to come back because she was afraid to go down, up and down the stairs. With this elevator, she became more mobile, had more opportunities. And we can do this for Maria Luisa. To her left is Anna. Anna used to uh, train with us uh, for a year. And when she went to visit her grandma in, in Alaska, discovered that she could apply some of these principles, principles of minimally disruptive medicine as, as a way of translating evidence-based practice uh, into the life of people like Maria Luisa. And she basically said, well, we need to change things. She enrolled a dietitian from Peru and gave her the information that the dietitian from Alaska gave her uh, grandma and found recipes, Peruvian flavored recipes that somebody can cook for grandma in Alaska for the week so she could have flavor in her food again and have joy. She moved her to the afternoon, and she got lucky in the afternoon, so she gained the mornings for the dialysis day. She gained the mornings. In the afternoon, the nurses, the dialysis nurses, uh, two of them spoke Spanish. Her world expanded. Um, she was able to uh, change her pill, uh, assorted pill box into an organized pill box, and she was able to move forward with that. We changed her from this to this. And Maria Luisa, I just heard, came back from Vegas, where she spent the weekend. <laughs> we don't know what happened there, because you know what happened <laughs> in Vegas. So at the end of the day, we go back and remember, this conference is about evidence, but it's not about evidence. It's about evidence-based medicine. What I think now is a human expression of care that is careful and kind. Thank you.